You hear me? Yeah, you hear me. Welcome everyone to this session, uh, a plenary session on uh, brain health and prevention. We already heard a lot about this topic during the conference. And I'm very happy that we now have a plenary session with uh, very distinguished speakers today. Uh, but before we start, uh, first we will hear a presentation of one of the nominees of the Anti-Stigma Awards. Uh, Niels Janssen is a postdoctoral researcher at the Alzheimer Center Limburg, presenting on an intergenerational project uh, on connecting young and old in uh, the Netherlands. Niels, the floor is yours. Um, can we see the slides? Not yet. Ah, yes. So, connecting generations to raise awareness and overcome stigma and taboo in dementia. This sentence, in essence, captures the adoption project. So, we are very grateful and uh, honored to be here today and talk about this project. And um, also many thanks and uh, to Alzheimer Europe for organizing this. And um, this project is a project, an adoption project, we do also in close collaboration with Alzheimer Netherlands. And on behalf of everyone involved, uh, I'm happy to tell you more about this. So the adoption project, um, it's about connecting children from a primary school with people living with dementia in a nursing home. And we aim at creating sustainable connections, so connections we hope for life, where children uh, visit year after year. The aims of the adoption project are threefold. The first is to reduce stigmatization and taboo, but also uh, open up the conversation about dementia. The second is for the children to understand the world of people living with dementia. And the last is to enhance social uh, participation and also increase the well-being. So first, children um, receive a lecture or a lesson about dementia um, and with a focus on the positive perspective of living with dementia. And after this uh, lesson, they visit a nursing home that, which is close by and uh, in small groups and uh, together undertake all kinds of activities. And together is also the key word here, which we see on these images, on the photos which we took. So for example, eating together, preparing a meal together, playing games together, walking, and many uh, more activities. We started off as a more regional uh, initiative in the south of the Netherlands. Here we see the map of the Netherlands. And now we are also busy with implementing this more on a national level, together in close collaboration also with Alzheimer Netherlands, uh, by training volunteers all over the country. And the impact, so during uh, all, um, we receive numerous of uh, positive reactions. And it's, it's difficult to have pick one um, because there are uh, yeah, many which we receive. And uh, I will um, yeah, read a quote uh, uh, which actually sums up a lot and also shows uh, and highlights the uh, energy uh, that the children bring and the positivity. So I support the project very much when I see what it means to our residents, but also how the children react. It is simply great to see. People who normally don't want to get out of bed get out of bed with ease when the children are there. The children put a smile on the faces of our residents. They ensure that the sun shines again in our home and in the hearts of our residents. And when I see how the children deal with situations they're not used to, so casual, natural, and warm-hearted, it's a joy to watch. Is a quote of a care home employee. And this highlights also the positivity, eh, uh, as I mentioned. And here are some reactions of, of children who participated. Eh, so, um, for example, I feel so sorry for my mother that grandma has Alzheimer's, or I got a bonus grandma. But also more general positive reactions like, it was really fun. 
The strengths of the adoption project are that it's, first, it's a tailored initiative, yeah, um, and it's inexpensive, and also therewith applicable to a variety of contexts. And we see that this project, this initiative, creates an impact on everyone involved and building to a better dementia-friendly society. So to conclude, uh, our initiative shows that by connecting children uh, with people living with dementia, uh, it does not take complicated and expensive interventions to create an impact on everyone involved. And with this message, I want to end uh, this short presentation. So children are the future of a dementia-friendly society. Thank you. Thank you, Niels, for presenting this warm-hearted project. And uh, yeah, at the uh, end closing ceremony, the, the uh, winner uh, will be uh, announced. Uh, but being selected uh, as one of the three nominees out of 50, uh, it makes you a winner anyway, I think. So congratulations on that. Um, so now we go on with the, the first speaker of the plenary session uh, in the symposium part, and uh, this is uh, Jan Steyaert. He's a scientific officer of the Flemish Center of Expertise on Dementia and a professor at the University of uh, Antwerp in the Faculty of Social Sciences. And his, uh, his work focuses on subjects such as prevalence, prevention, and advanced care planning. And uh, he's also a very uh, appreciated and active member of Interdem. And the presentation uh, of today is uh, illus illustrative of his efforts to translate scientific evidence into daily practice of dementia care, I think. So, please, the floor is yours. Thank you. Once upon a time, that's how good stories start. I thought, well, maybe that works for presentations as well. Once upon a time, and I can be more specific, in 1950, two articles were published that influence our daily life, even today, 70 years, uh, 72 years afterwards. Two scholarly papers with a huge influence. And I need to push. And those were published about a correlation they found between smoking and lung cancer. 1950, that caused a lot of discussion. Is there a correlation? Is that true? Remember, no, we not many will remember the time before 1950, but know that doctors used to prescribe smoking when patients had a cough. And then suddenly there's researchers that say it causes lung cancer. So lots of discussion, and then correlation became causality, and then there became anti-smoking policies 70 years onwards. This is still influencing our life. I can remember a time when there was smoking in restaurants. When you, when you stepped on a train, you had to choose between smoking and non-smoking. I, I remember flying to Central America once, next to it, a person smoking, chain smoking. 10 hours on a... That's changed dramatically. Um, there's a wonderful supplement of the British Medical Journal in 2007 that describes the breakthrough innovations in medical history throughout humankind, and this is one of them, causality. Um, smoking and lung cancer. Even the effect, just an illustration of the effect of these two uh, publications, even James Bond stopped smoking. <laughs> he didn't stop drinking yet, but no one's perfect, right? Now, the interesting thing about these two 1950 articles is, and the changes it made, the dramatic changes in life, in medical care, in healthcare, is that in our area of dementia care, we've seen the same thing happening over the past decade. And a nice analogy can be made between those two 1950 articles and the ones published by the Lancet Committee on um, Dementia Care. 19, uh, 2017, the message was, be ambitious. 2020 update was, there's more to be gained from modifiable risk factors than we believed in 2017. So the message improved. Um, I know these two articles 
are not doing respect to all the underlying research that happened and that the Lancet Committee, Joe Livingstone, summarized um, the work from Finnish uh, researchers and the CAIDE index they made, the work from Maastricht and the Libra index. We've heard presentations about that today. Those are all reflected in that Lancet committee. But those, of course, the Lancet is well known, is well read, has a loud voice, and it's a nice analogy with those 1950. Uh, still, a lot needs to be researched in terms of what are the modifiable risk factors? This doesn't work very well. Or it's me that's not handling it right. Um, a lot of things still need to be researched because we've seen, just like smoking and lung cancer, we see correlation, but that's not always causality. We know that there's more factors than we identify at this moment. This morning we had a parallel session where presentations were giving about sleep, how is sleep influencing our risk on dementia? Um, hearing, how is hearing related to dementia risk? And how is addressing hearing by providing hearing aid and uh, quieter rooms, meeting rooms, how is that influencing risk on dementia? So a lot more re needs to be researched. But Bradford Hill, one of those authors of the 1950, articles, he says, well, while we still need more research, if the available research is sufficient enough, we need to take action. We can't wait until all the research questions have been answered. And that means that the available research from the past decade, not just the two Lancet articles, but many more uh, research articles and, and accumulating research insights, those add a third challenge to our work. We know from that research now, not all the details, but we know dementia is not just genes and age. There's more to it. There's modifiable risk factors. So that means on top of the challenge to provide good dementia care, on top of the challenge to find pharmaceutical solutions that we've read about over the past weeks for dementia, there's now a third challenge to address primary preventions and actually work around brain health. That means, and I was going to say, for that ter third challenge, that means we need you, each one of you in this room. But then there's this iconic photograph of we need you and we're close to war. So I wasn't going to use that icon or that photo. And also yesterday I felt a bit of pressure to use a different metaphor. So. Um, no, first, I forgot this one, a secret. The Lancet is well read by scientists, by medical scientists. But not many people in society read the Lancet. And if you believe it or not, not many people read scholarly journals. That's a rarity. So that means that awareness of that insight that grew over the past decade, like modifiable risk factors for dementia, that's available in this room. That's aware, people in this room are aware of that. People in the dementia care become aware of that. But people in society still have a low awareness of those modifiable risk factors. There's research here mentioned by Irene Hegger from Maastricht, her PhD this year, that shows that awareness, using Dutch data, awareness is rather low. A lot can be done on that. The other one from Stephanie van Asbroek, uh, also, well, using Flemish data, also indicating awareness is low. There's a poster from Norway in the other room indicating awareness in Norway is a bit higher, but it's very unbalanced. So a lot of work needs to be done. And that's where that metaphor comes in that I felt inclined to use, which is the bridges. We need to build bridges. We are involved in science, we are involved in working on good dementia care, but we also need to be, build bridges to society and make sure that the general population knows about these modifiable risk factors about brain health and actually is aware of what can be done and so that we can avoid what we at the moment can't 
cure yet. That's our third challenge. Uh, I found this on the internet yesterday evening, uh, following the plenary sessions, and before any UK colleague is gonna say, yes, I've heard rumors that the trust bridge, there is some design issues with that. <laughs> it might be not that reliable, but forget about that one, and let's look at the other bridges. Because that third challenge of increasing awareness about brain health, there are many different types of bridges that we can build, uh, from extra small to extra large, and everything in between. And I'm going to give you, in the next minutes, a couple of examples uh, across Europe from what is happening at this moment, what can happen um, in terms of promoting brain health increasing awareness about modifiable risk factors for dementia. Just check each of those examples with your own situation. Do you have that in your organization? Is it relevant for your organization or for your project? Can you in incorporate some of those ideas in your work? Websites. I could ask who has a website, who has social media, but then everybody would say yes. So. On your website, if it's relevant, do you have information on brain health, on modifiable risk factors? This is an example from Alzheimer Nederland, who have uh, a number of items on prevention on their website. It's not always on the front page because it's a moving, dynamic website, but this can be found very easily. Uh, simple information about uh, brain health, a small test, and for those who need more information, they can actually uh, download a brochure of about 20, 25 pages in accessible language. That's an example. Feel invited to check whether you can do this kind of things in your organizations. Accessible information. I was already saying that people, citizens, don't read The Lancet, but we are beginning to get popular science, and in big stores that's called popular science. Mia Kivipelto just published a book on brain health, accessible science, nice photographs in there, a bunch of recipes for healthy stuff. That's kind of helpful for us as well. Publish a book review about such publications to pr promote awareness of brain health. Um, free publicity. Kai Dekkers, who organizes an interview in the internal journal for civil servants of the Ministry of Health. It's free publicity, it's an hour's work. It's finding a journalist who wants to publish that. Just go for it because everybody of us knows a journalist or a, a freelance writer who can get that message in some kind of magazine. We had it in the magazine of the Liberal Health Insurance Company, 120,000 copies distributed. That's an easy way to do. An example from Maastricht with a public awareness campaign. We are the medicine. Posters in bus waiting um, places. Does broccoli help against dementia? Does walking help against dementia? Trigger interest and lead people to a website that provides more information. Increase awareness. Uh, another one, a campaign that we launched uh, in May, with the slogan, two for the price of one, we were very surprised that a website address was still available and not taken by supermarkets, <laughs> but where we promoted the idea what's good for your heart is good for your brain, uh, and trigger interest, we printed apples, that we 15,000 of them that we distributed in markets. We have uh, these little baskets that we distributed to pharmacies, uh, websites, video and all that to promote that brain awareness. That material is also available to use in nursing homes. You see here one in Antwerp where they did a family group uh, with our inflatable brain app for people to actually see what is, how does the wo brain work and also to trigger interest, a bit like uh, the Maastricht campaign about We Are The Campaign. All of these kind of resources are pretty open access. So if you see some opportunity in your organization to actually use those, just contact the persons working with that material 
and ask whether they can use it. This one was also developed in cooperation with the Alzheimer Liga in Flanders uh, and a couple of other organizations. Just, just look for material, look for opportunities, and feel invited to work on brain awareness. Again, those bridges. Um, we need you to see what you in your organization, in your project, from your position, can do to help increase uh, that awareness. But know that uh, br building bridges calls for engineers. Working on public health calls for specialists. And that's the second result that the two 1950 articles had. Not just that we are not smoking anymore, or less, much less, not anymore in trains, not anymore in airports, not anymore in restaurants, but also that there's a, um, another area of work in healthcare that's called preventive healthcare. And there are those know how to design and implement campaigns to increase public health awareness because there are plenty of challenges there. One is don't blame the victim. Why? Well, we've been talking about anti-stigma at Alzheimer Europe conferences. So we're not going to point individuals and blame them uh, like the smoking, anti-smoking campaigns do. That would be wrong. Also because changing in lifestyles is not just an individual issue, it's a social issue. Have you heard the sentence, sitting is the new smoking? Why are you all sitting? <laughs> That's because the room is designed to sit. And so the, the, the culture in conferences is to sit down at meetings, in the office, and conferences. Alzheimer Europe, can we ask you to provide in Helsinki, the next conference, a couple of those, less chairs, and a couple of those reception tables so that people can stand and actually write, that may still make notes, but work at, you have a choice whether you sit down or stand. Everybody in this room, if you organize a conference, feel addressed and to look whether you can do that, organize that in your conferences as well, to avoid blaming the victim and making lifestyle choices a social thing rather. Another challenge is we need to reach, reach high risk groups. We know people with non-Western ethnicity, people in poverty are at higher risk of dementia. We also know that average public health campaign doesn't reach those groups as much as they should do. So involve public health organizations to actually address those challenges of not blaming the victim, reaching high group, uh, high risk groups, reaching intermediaries. Don't do the work all yourself. Try to liaise with GPs, with pharmacies as we did, with GPs as well, uh, by the way, uh, with journalists, because they frame what happens in the news media, uh, if they are become aware of brain health and about risk reduction in dementia, that actually works on a long-term basis. Every country has organizations working on uh, public health. We cooperated a lot with the Flemish Institute uh, on healthy living, and that was a very good cooperation. Most countries have RIVM in the Netherlands, I've heard yesterday that in Germany, and if I pronounce correctly, it's the Bundescentrale voor Gesundheitsliche Aufklärung. I hope my German was. Every country has that kind of organizations. Liaise with them uh, to avoid those challenges, to avoid blaming the victim, to avoid uh, forgetting about high risk group, to avoid clickbait cures. When I do lectures about prevention, there's always someone asking, does chocolate help? Sorry, no. Does a glass of champagne a day help? Sorry, no. It's more complex than that, so avoid simplicity. And maybe we should look for, I mean, aging and mental health, dementia, those are journals that are being read by us regularly. Well, try reading Preventive Medicine and the European Journal of Public Health as well to cross over to, to build strategic alliances between dementia care 
and that third challenge of risk reduction, aw increasing awareness, and public health. Finally, a slide with some words on it. The take home messages. Thank you. Thank you, Jan, for this important uh, message of, uh, of raising awareness and the challenge also to bring scientific evidence into practice. So what, what will be the happy end to this story if it's up to you? Well, the happy end will be, oh, it's gone my key message. Uh, the happy end will be that the predicted increase of number of people with dementia will slow down. That doesn't reduce the other challenges because we still need pharmaceutical solutions. And honestly, I'm 60 now. Uh, the increase, the predicted increase in number of persons with dementia, the care is not up to that increase at this moment. So if we promote brain health, and it's gonna be a slow process because dementia is a slow process, uh, maybe the cure both at home, hospitals, nursing homes can cope with that reduced inflation or increase of persons with dementia. Okay. So are there any questions here in the room or maybe at home online? Everybody's thinking about what can I do with this at home in my organization, <laughs> in my project? No questions? Yes, yeah. over there. Georgina? Do you have a mic or speak loud? <laughs> Can you repeat uh, the question? Maybe? Well, the question is the CPAS study in the UK showed that the uh, predicted increase of persons with dementia is already be decreasing, yes? Um, true, we're not hearing that news enough, uh, and that's happening, that basically triggered the idea of, hey, there may be some modifiable risk factors like 10 years ago. That was one of the first studies that triggered that interest. Um, the, the question is, how can we increase that, what is already happening at a slower speed and increase, make that a more rapid process? And that's by increasing awareness, by promoting brain health. Okay, one more question, yeah? Oh, this David? one here. In the back. Uh, yeah, thank you for the talk. Um, one of the things about smoking, which I think is a great example, is that it really almost kind of spawned the whole field of uh, behavioral science, because the observation was, we told people that smoking caused lung cancer, and they didn't stop. Um, do you have any examples of really good collaborations with behavioral scientists in the field of uh, brain health and prevention? It didn't stop is not exactly true. Well, it is true in the sense that there's still people smoking, but in 1950, 90% of male smoked. Now it's 20% for the whole population. So there was a very substantial reduction of smoking behavior. Uh, and that's worldwide. If you look at Western countries, that's even better, those figures. Uh, I thought, I, I did look for, can I find prevalence figures of lung cancer that matches the smoking behavior. I didn't actually find them, so I need to look further for that. Um, yeah. Okay, thank you so much, uh, Jan, for... I had another question. Oh. <laughs> Sorry. Oh, yeah. I, I guess the challenge is not to talk about um, prevention, but to talk about primary prevention and also to make the difference between primary prevention, prevention and risk re reduction. And I guess the challenge there is to reach people at the right time. Yes. 
um, because we can talk about risk reduction at the age of typically the, the people we are addressing at, um, we're, we're speaking to our people aged 60 plus when we, do, um, when we talk about prevention. But actually primary prevention targets people between the age of 30 and 40. And that's the big challenge. It's, and there we, there the taboo and the stigma is even, even higher. So what would be your advice? Um, I mean, to go away from these typical target uh, audience, 60 plus, to go to a target in between, so not children, as we saw in other pro program projects, or teenagers or young adults, but people between their 30 and 40 for themselves, and not as an adult children of, of their parents, who might be concerned, but for themselves, and to talk yes. about um, lifestyle um, in, in that age. Yes, you're right. I mean, dementia is a slow process, slow motion process. It takes 15, 20 years. So if we see people with, that come for a diagnosis or a suspect suspected dementia, that we're not talking about primary prevention anymore. That's secondary prevention, that's a different topic. Uh, now the work around the Libra score um, it indicates that the target audience should be 40 to 75 for risk reduction. And that means that it's not really our typical audience, um, but it, it, it are the children and the family caregivers of that typical audience. So we can use our traditional channels, say, but also look for new channels like those public awareness campaigns, like the website, uh, provide information for that group. Yeah. Thank you. So we go on to the next speaker. Thank you so much, uh, Jan, for your contribution today. And uh, the next speaker is uh, Edo Richard. He is a professor of neurology at the Radboud University Medical Center in Nijmegen and the Department of Public Health at Amsterdam Medical Center. And he's a science practitioner combining patient care and research focusing on the prevention of uh, dementia. And uh, he leads various uh, large national trials on risk factor modifications to re reduce dementia risk. And that's also what you're going to talk about today, I presume. Okay, thank you very much for the kind introduction, uh, Marjolein, and uh, thanks to Alzheimer Europe for the invitation to speak here today about what the ways forward are towards dementia prevention. And it's self-evident that 30 to 40% of all dementia is attributable to potentially modifiable risk factors. There's overwhelming evidence for that. And most of these risk factors exert their most detrimental effects in midlife but some of them all extend all the way into late life, but others are much more prominent in early life. So how do we translate, as Jan already made the stage for me, how do we translate these observations into effective interventions? Well, many such initiatives have already taken place. Several randomized clinical trials have probed multi-domain interventions targeting several or all of these risk factors together, trying to prevent dementia. And we did a Cochrane review and meta-analysis, and we found nine studies of sufficient size and quality to include, with a total of almost 20,000 people participating in these trials, with a wide range of duration between one and 10 years. Only two trials looked at dementia, and we couldn't show that dementia can actually be prevented with this type of interventions, in spite of very long duration and considerable sample size. We did find some evidence that cognition can be affected by this type of intervention based on three randomized controlled trials. But the effect size is very small, 0.03 was the standardized mean difference. And one of these trials actually showed improvement in the control group and a slight excess improvement in the intervention group. So we can hardly conclude from this that we can actually reduce the risk of cognitive decline. So why can we not confirm all the observations in our intervention trials? And I think this has to do with several challenges we encounter when we design dementia prevention studies. First of all, how do we actually determine what the optimal risk factor targets are? And who should we target? And how should we reach and engage the right people? And following the last question in the previous presentation, when should we actually intervene? And which outcomes should we use? 
diagnosis. Yes. Um, for the target level, I'd like to take blood pressure as an example. We recently did an individual participant data meta-analysis with 17,000 individuals in seven cohorts with an uh, age of 74, a mean at baseline, and a considerable follow-up of seven years. And you see the main results in the graph here. On the x-axis, you see the systolic blood pressure at baseline, and on the y-axis, you see the risk of dementia. In blue, dementia, in orange, mortality, and in black, dementia and mortality combined. And what you can appreciate is that this association is not linear. It's J-shaped, or actually U-shaped, if you wish, with both a, a low and a high blood pressure imposing an increased risk of dementia. And we stratified our analyses by age, and we saw that this U-shape becomes more apparent in older age groups, in the oldest people. You see that the blood pressure associated with the lowest risk of dementia is over 150 millimeter mercury. Now, obviously, this doesn't mean we should try to raise the blood pressure of all older people. And of course, this is all observational data, so it's prone to many sources of bias and even reverse causality. But at the same time, it forces us to reconsider whether lower is really always better for all populations or whether they should be more personalized. And similar U-shapes have actually been described for BMI and for cholesterol as well. So we wonder, just like in midlife, if you have more risk factors at a high level, you have a higher risk of dementia. Maybe in late life, if you have more risk factors with a low level, you have an increased risk of dementia. So we address this in our own Prediva study, which are people uh, between the age of 70 and 78, so again, older people with a considerable follow-up, and we looked at those in the study with the lowest level of systolic blood pressure, the lowest value for BMI, and the lowest value for cholesterol. And in fact, this hypothesis was confirmed, at least in this data set, that if you have two or even three low values for these risk factors when you're older, you actually have the highest risk of dementia. So this really confirms that we have to rethink the target values for different populations when we're trying to pro prevention trials. And then who should we target? In the upper two blue panes, I try to depict the balance between the risk of dementia and the prevalence of this type of people in the population. So on the far left, you have those with a very high risk of dementia. These are relatively rare in the population whereas those with an intermediate or lower risk of dementia are relatively more common in society. So if you want to target those very high-risk populations, you should probably select them using advanced diagnostic tests, maybe even neuroimaging, or maybe even genetic tests. And in theory, you can design very uh, focused targeted therapies for a small group of individuals, which can be very effective for these individuals. But the impact at the population level will be small because they are so rare. So you can also design pragmatic trials for those with an intermediate or lower risk of dementia. But then you need readily available risk parameters, such as simple demographics, anthropometry, or use family history as a proxy for genetic risk. And then you can easily do large pragmatic randomized controls in these people. And then the effect on the individuals will be very small but the potential effect at the population level will be much larger. And I think we need both. I, need, I think we need individually targeted interventions and whole population interventions. Because some risk factors are more amenable to individual interventions, others to population interventions, and some to both. And I gave some examples here in a paper from Sebastian Walsh about the different risk factors. For instance, for obesity and inactivity, you can have very targeted weight measure management programs. But at the same time, we really need to improve the living environment and maybe create bike lanes and green spaces which are inviting to, uh, to uh, exercise. And of course, you can have a dietitian address an unhealthy diet. But at the same time, we need government policies to actually raise a sugar tax, for instance. And of course, we need to continue case finding and treatment for hypertension. And at the same time, we also need to address the food industry to finally make them reduce the amount of salt in processed food. And for education, for instance, particularly in low-income uh, countries, 
you need major societal and governmental changes to affect dementia prevalence probably in decades from now. So we need both. But how do we engage people in actually improving their lifestyle? And often e-health or mobile health have been suggested as a potential way to have a wide reach of people. So we put that to the test of a randomized controlled trial. And we recruited 3,000 older people with dementia risk factors and we randomized them to either uh, use a coach-supported e-health platform specifically focusing on improving lifestyle, facilitating goal setting and monitoring your own progress or being randomized to a sham platform which was similar in appearance but lacked any interactive features and had no coach support. And we continued this intervention for 18 months and we used a composite outcome of objectively measurable risk factors, systolic blood pressure, BMI and LDL. And indeed, we could show that in the intervention group, this composite risk score improved more than in the control condition. But the effect was very small, 0.05 standard deviation. And of course, it's uncertain whether this effect is sustainable over longer periods of time. And it's even more uncertain whether this will translate into the actual prevention of cognitive decline. And very often, this type of interventions are criticized by the fact that they apparently only reach those who need it least, those who are more affluent, who are more tax savvy. And I think these critics, critics are correct. And therefore, we were actually positively surprised that in our pre-specified subgroup analyses, we found that the intervention was uh, seen to be most effective in those in our study with the lowest level of education. So that shows two things. One, that we can reach these people with this type of intervention. And two, that these are the people who have the largest window of opportunity for improvement because they also have the highest level of risk factors. And I think we should also look at specific populations at higher risk. It was already mentioned by Jan, those with a low socioeconomic status, but also people with a migration background. So we and others did qualitative research to assess how can we reach and actually engage these people. We did qualitative interviews and we found that in those people with a low socioeconomic status, they have a very uh, a perceived influence on their own health. It's very low. The locus of control lies somewhere else, not within themselves. And they feel that the sacrifices of a healthy lifestyle outweigh the benefits. And mind you about the framing, they consider it sacrifices. And physical complaints or disease, that's what could prompt behavior change in these people. Not the idea that they can prevent dementia 15 years down the road from now. And we found that a good social network can actually catalyze behavior change. And we really need to incorporate this type of knowledge to design more effective prevention studies. So then, when should we intervene? Because you know dementia is preceded by cognitive decline by many years, which is in itself then preceded by the underlying brain changes and the risk factors by years to decades. So with individual interventions, we could target those with some memory impairment or complaints or those at highest risk to get that in the coming years. And with public health interventions, we should probably target those much earlier when they have their risk factors or even target healthy individuals to prevent the risk factors from occurring, so-called primordial prevention. But the major challenge is then how do we confirm that these interventions were actually effective? And this brings me to the last challenge, the outcomes. And I've add some, added some granularity to the blue bar here with functional impairment between cognitive impairment and dementia and subjective complaints. And of course, we all would like to use a clinical diagnosis of dementia as primary outcome. Because it's very clear that that's what we want to prevent and there's no discussion about the clinical relevance of that. However, I also showed this is very challenging. You need to be patient, you need very large studies with a very long follow-up. So this is very difficult, although not impossible. Of course, you can also use activities or instrumental activities of daily living or uh, cognitive performance on a cognitive test battery as outcome. And then the challenge is how do we decide what the minimally clinically important difference on a cognitive test battery is? 
If you have a very small effect, which is statistically significant on a cognitive test, has the patient or the caregiver truly benefited? Well, this is always a very difficult point of discussion. And even if you have found such an effect, is it sustained over longer periods of time? And does it actually postpone or prevent the further cognitive deterioration? And finally, of course, you can use a biomarker or for that matter, a dementia risk score as outcome. But it's clear that this can only be considered as phase two outcomes, proof of concept. And I think a very good example of that is that over the past 20 years, we have seen many randomized controlled trials using anti-amyloid therapy. And several of them were very effective in reducing amyloid from the brain. The PET scan improved, but it didn't translate into any benefit for patients and caregivers. So this can only be considered as proof of concept. So in conclusion, I think for risk factors, lower may actually not always be better. I think reaching and engaging the right populations is extremely challenging and we should closely involve these populations in our intervention design. I think whole population approaches may or actually should complement individual interventions. Timing is everything and also makes it very complicated. And so far, we simply do not have convincing evidence that dementia can be prevented. And therefore, I think we should be open and honest to our patients and to the public about this. But there are many other reasons to engage into a healthy lifestyle. So we can communicate along the lines of what's good for the heart is good for the brain. We can communicate that a healthier lifestyle is actually will reduce your risk of cardiovascular disease and stroke. We know that. We also know that you will feel better if you lose weight and if you exercise more. And we also know you'll save a lot of money if you stop smoking. And okay, we can add to that. It may also reduce your risk of cognitive decline and dementia, although we're still not completely certain about that. I'd like to thank all my national and international collaborators and all our uh, non-profit funding organizations for our research. And thank you for your attention. Okay, thank you, uh, Edo. And you end up with some challenging uh, conclusions, I guess. Are there any questions from the audience? Nobody? So I was wondering, uh, uh, based on, on your conclusions, do you think uh, that we should not then have dedicated prevention campaigns uh, relating uh, lifestyle uh, change to, to brain health? Do you think we should aim for a more general approach? Well, I think we should piggyback with on, on, the, on the prevention campaigns of, for car prevention of cardiovascular disease. The public are not waiting for 50 campaigns, one to prevent cancer, one to prevent cardiovascular disease, one for diabetes, one for dementia. So I think we should really join forces. And I think we can communicate the, the message about brain health, but we also have to be honest about what's certain and what's maybe plausible or maybe. So I really think we should communicate, yes, you should engage into a healthier lifestyle because you will prevent cardiovascular disease and stroke, and maybe also cognitive decline in dementia. But I think we have to be careful. There's so much at play here. So many other factors have changed. Society has changed dramatically over the past 50, 50 years. Mm -hmm. So the fact that the dementia incidence may be slightly declining in some of the observational cohorts, which took different strata uh, in which they, uh, they included people, can also have been the consequences of societal changes, for instance, because we really changed a lot of things. Education improved. So we simply need to be careful about inferring causality. Thanks. Any other questions or comments? No? OK, I thank you thank for your you. contribution. Thanks. So last speaker of the session is uh, Wiesje van der Vlier. It's, uh, she's a professor and scientific director of the Alzheimer Center Amsterdam at Amsterdam UMC in the Netherlands. And her background is neuropsychology and clini clinical epidemiology. 
she's a very active and productive researcher focusing on the origin of uh, Alzheimer's disease prevention, diagnosis, and intervention. So uh, today she, you will talk about uh, communicating risk. Thank you, Marjolein, and thanks to the organizers for inviting me to uh, talk to you today about assessing risk and communication of risk. And these are the disclosures, my disclosures. Um, and we're switching gears here a little bit. I think both former speakers talked about lifestyle and how this can help in help or may not help in primary prevention. And I think they also very much took a population-based or a public health perspective. And we're really switching gears here to the clinical setting because most of what I will be say, saying is relevant to the population of individuals with mild cognitive impairments that you might encounter in a memory clinic. And I think that we can safely say that we are heading towards a future with personalized medicine for Alzheimer's disease. We're not there yet, but this is the direction we are moving towards. And I think that when you think about that future, key is that we should focus on the stages before dementia. When you think about Alzheimer's disease, the dementia stage is only the last stage of this, this disease, the largest part of which takes place before that stage. Think about the mild cognitive impairment, and before that there's of course also the preclinical Alzheimer's disease. And the second starting point, so you will, is uh, that I think personalized means taking into account individual differences. And individuals with Alzheimer's disease are like all other individuals. Everybody is different, and that matters. So we need to take action. And in the Netherlands, we have this initiative, which is called the Abort Project. And it's a great pleasure to me that many of the Dutch researchers here today are working in the context of this project. And it's a public-private consortium of over 30 partners. And public-private means that we we collaborate with organizations from academia, healthcare institutions, companies, um, uh, societal organizations, so the whole uh, knowledge chain, as you might say. And together, we aim to prepare for a future where Alzheimer's disease is stopped before dementia has started. So that would be prevention, prevent the dementia stage of Alzheimer's disease. And our approach is that we have a lot of work to do. It's important to have an early or timely and an accurate diagnosis. We should also develop personal risk profiles and support patient orchestrated care, make sure that the patients and their loved ones are at the steering wheel. For example, with the use of e-tools, and we already heard something about that, for example, from the Hatice project. We want to evaluate the Dutch healthcare system for readiness for market access of these medications of the future. And we want to focus on prevention strategies that entail both lifestyle and disease modifying treatment in the future. So in fact, we want to prepare a future patient journey. And we are talking here about diagnosis, prediction and prevention. In this, in this presentation, I will focus on the prediction part, where the development of the personal risk profiles is really about assessing risk, and then the next step is, okay, when you know a risk, what do you do about it? How do you commu communicate about this? <coughs> and in the field of Alzheimer's disease, we have made a lot of progress. So with the use of diagnostic tests, such as MRI, such as biomarkers in CSF, or, at, or imaging, PET imaging, and perhaps also fast approaching to the diagnostic field to blood-based biomarkers in the near future, we can actually diagnose Alzheimer's disease before the stage of dementia. But when you do that, then in fact the diagnosis becomes a prognosis. And you might ask the question, what is the impact of such a diagnosis that is in fact also a prognosis? And here I would like to share with you the results of a work done by Jetske van der Schaar, and she did a systematic review on, theoretical, on articles providing theoretical arguments on the broad impact of such a diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease before the stage of dementia. 
And from 27 articles, she extracted 26 unique considerations on this broad impact. And you see them depicted in the figure. And we were able to group them with, with, a, with respect to their primary relevance, whether they were primary clinical re clinically relevant or personally relevant or we had societal relevance. And you see a lot of things like utility or validity of these biomarkers, but also the how certain are you, is there actionability or is there no actionability, but also hope and stigma. So many things were mentioned that you also hear me being mentioned here throughout the conference this week. So we found that these considerations were heterogeneous and also often conflicting. So an argument that might be used as a pro-argument, so you can have such a diagnosis before the stage of dementia, would also be used as an against, a con argument. And some of these arguments were also really relevant for communication of risk. Think about disclosure and whether there are protocols for such, for uh, such activities. And also with the clinical relevance or the more personal relevance, the wish to know your biomarker results, your diagnosis, or the wish not to know, and even the right to know and the right not to know. So there's a lot of, of debate here going on and a lot of thoughts to have. And I think such a review is really very relevant because it gives us a good starting point to have this dialogue and to have this discussion. And the next question we set out to answer is, so what about current risk communication in the doctor-patient communication? And this is a study where we actually listened into the diagnostic consultations of MCI patients. And in the background is, is that in the American guidelines for MCI, it states that the diagnosis is important for MCI patients to understand the cause of their complaints, to discuss prognosis, also the risk of dementia, and for, in order to arrange long-term care planning. So what we did as part of the audio, uh, Abide audio tape study is that we actually cons uh, audio taped consultations, diagnostic consultations of 13 MCI patients of 10 different clinicians throughout the Netherlands. And we con uh, performed a thematic content analysis of these uh, encounters. And what we found is that the clinicians, in fact, differed very much in the language they used. So half of them actually used the word mild cognitive impairment, but the other half used a ver variety of different terms to more or less describe what they had found. They only tentatively addressed the cause of these symptoms, and the cause could be Alzheimer's disease or could also not be Alzheimer's disease. And even if they had biomarker, avail biomarker information available, they were very reluctant to share this information. And when this biomarker information was not available, they actually implicitly steered against additional biomarker testing, stating that it would not provide certainty. They rarely informed about the risk of dementia, and when they did so, it was in very general terms. So this is MCI, it means that you have a 50-50 risk of developing dementia or not. And more in general, the clinicians actually um, prefer to, to foster hope. Uh, and they emphasize the potential of actually sta stabilizing uh, or even improving uh, the symptoms. And none of them engaged in a conversation on long-term care planning. So what we concluded is that communication about risk is difficult um, and, uh, and challenging. And of course, when you want to communicate about risk, you have to have information about the risk, risk assessment, and then you know, have to uh, know how can I do that best, what would be a best practice. So when we talk about the risk assessment, so what is the risk, actually the biomarkers can help in uh, improving the knowledge about dementia risk in these MCI patients. So, from a group, so we did some research to move from group level information towards individual risk prediction and, and showed that biomarkers can really help here. Um, so very briefly, when you would have, based on these models, I could talk a very long time about it, but I'm not going to do that now, when you would have a 62-year-old female patient in your office and she had an MMSE of 28, which is really fairly good, and you knew nothing else about this patient, her three-year risk of dementia would be in the order of 30%, and her five-year risk would be 43% in this young 62-year-old MCI patient. So when we would now have also information on MRI showing mild atrophy 
and CSF biomarkers being normal, we could actually look this patient up in these colorful isographs and then re read the risk. And the risk would actually be reduced to only 12% risk of dementia after three years and only 20%, 19% after five years. So that's a significant reduction. So this model is not perfect. So let that be clear. It's not a perfect model, but it shows that we're heading towards being able to make a personal prediction. So I would say, let's say we can do the risk assessment. So the next question is how to communicate about this. What about the patient? Do the patient even want a prognosis? And should you even do such a biomarker test? And in the end, everybody is different. So a meaningful dialogue might help to personalize the diagnosis. And actually to find out what patients want from a diagnosis and what uh, also clinicians think is relevant, we conducted a Delphi study where we asked a panel of clinicians and a panel of patients and a panel of caregivers what were topics that they deemed relevant in the diagnostic journey? So before embarking on diagnostic tests and also afterwards. And we ended up with a 25 item list, a topic list of 25 items on what is the meaning of the diagnostic test? What can you learn from it? What can you not learn from it? What is the prognosis? What are the implications of a diagnosis? Very long list. And then we thought, how do we package this list? Because nobody likes a 25 25 bullet list and this is why we made these animations and you can see here you can see it here and you can look it up at adept.health you see that on the on the bottom line uh, and we com combined all these topics in the animations and also ma also made a print sheet where people can actually print see the most important topics they can expect during the diagnostic journey and also add what they would like to ask so it helps they can help to prepare for a memory clinic visit helping patients and their families to discuss what to expect from the memory clinic visit, wh whether they would have any questions that they would like to see answered, and what would they want to know from their diagnosis. So we have two animations, one for the first visit and one for the visit after the diagnosis. And one of the most important things that came out of the Delphi study, and that was actually one of the few topics where patients and their families differed a bit from the clinicians, is that patients and families do want prognostic information. They want to know, doctor, what can I expect? So, how to provide that information? And the problem is that risk, is a, another word for risk is probability, and probability means uncertainty. And I already told you that we're developing these risk models, but these prediction models are not perfect, so that implies more uncertainty. And that means it's difficult for the patients. And many clinicians says, say, well, it's not relevant to share this information with my patients because they are so overwhelmed by all the information and this is far too complicated for them. So they cannot understand. And in fact, whilst that may be true, it's also true that it's very difficult for the clinician, for the doctor to explain because risk is a very difficult concept to explain. It's important to know that risk communication does not provide a certain outcome. That you have different types of information with different degrees of uncertainty. So you have to manage the expectations. What can you learn and what can you not learn? There should also be some kind of shared decision making there. What is the motivation for somebody to learn this information? Are they willing, willing to receive the results? And you have to have clarity on what, what type of risk are we talking about? Is it a risk of Alzheimer's disease pathology in your brain? Or is it a risk of dementia? Risk of dementia in a few years? Lifetime risk? Is it in a memory clinic setting? Is it in a population-based setting? How accurate are the models? And what are the best methods of communication? And here we thought we're not the first that, that struggle with this, top, with this topic. So we thought, what can we learn from our colleagues, for example, in oncology? where they have such a lot of experience with this topic and has, have also done a lot of research. Also done a lot of research on communication of risks because they have to weigh risks and benefits of different treatments, treatment options, and to come to a shared uh, and informed decision. So under risk, understanding the risk is then essential but difficult. So here on the left, there's a, a list of the things that should be done. So you should use plain language and present absolute risks. 
don't use qualitative descriptors. So for example, say 80% of patients, or better, out of 100 patients like you, 80% would have would develop dementia or would not develop dementia. In general, you might be inclined to think, well, 80 out of 100, how useful is that? I will say a high risk. But it's known from this type of research that people have such difficult, dif different conceptions of what means high or low risk that's better to use the actual numbers. Use visuals. Bar graphs, line graphs, pictograms, preferences differ, but do use visuals to explain the risk. Then there's the number needed to treat. That's a rather difficult epidemiological concept. And the general, the general take home here is don't use it in the risk communication because people get lost. So we skip it here as well. But this is relevant, so use both framings. So when there would be a, like a 65% a risk of uh, dementia, what do I have here? 35% risk of dementia, use both framings. Out of 100 patients like you, in the course of three years, 65 would not develop dementia. Out of 100 patients like you, in the course of three years, 35 would develop dementia. So provide both these informations. And finally, it's all about the time interval. Hearing we all have a 20% risk, dementia risk, somewhere in our lives is something completely difficult, different than hearing the risk within one year, three years, five years. So this time interval matters. So the next step we made is thought, thinking, can we do something about actually studying how this would work in the setting of MCI, communication of MCI risk of dementia? And this is what we did. We, we set out to, to study how best to explain the increased risk of dementia to an MCI patient who receives the result of an amyloid positive PET scan. So the PET scan shows Alzheimer's pathology, and this implies that as an MCI patient, your risk of dementia is higher. We said it is 70% in the course within three years. And then we did a randomized controlled trial, and that means we compared groups. We had seven different groups, and each of these groups received a video, watched a video, where uh, the doctor presents the result of the PET scan and also explains the increased risk of dementia to a patient and uh, his daughter. And the seven videos differed in whether they used the explicit, explicit, uh, the, the, the explicit mentioning of the risk or only said high or low, whether there was a use of visual, uh, whether the PET scan was shown, whether there was actually acknowledgement of the emotion in the patient. Well, there were seven differences. And then we showed this video, to pa not to patients, but to individuals, uh, over 1,000 of them, who were invited to imagine being the patient. And actually this kind of video design with these uh, imagine to be patients has been used in oncology uh, a lot. Uh, and the outcomes were how well they understood what had been conveyed, whether the impact on emotions, anxiety, depression, depressive feelings, whether there were impact on behavioral intentions, and the trust and satisfaction with the doctor and the consultation. And we found that the risk communication best practice, that means mentioning the natural frequency, like 70 out of 100, the neutral framing, like I just explained, both the risk of dementia and the risk of not dementia, and also the graphical representation, the acknowledgement of emotions, I see that is, this is, has impact on you, and the teach-back method, asking the patient and their family to explain what has just been told to them, had a positive impact on the recall, so the understanding of the information, but also on the trust in the doctor and the satisfaction with the consultation. So here you see that we took a first step towards empirical uh, studying of how we best communicate risk. And in the ADAPT, we actually incorporated a number of these best practices. Uh, and this is an e-tool to support the diagnostic process and also the risk communication. We now have a first in kind, including these prediction models based on MRI and CSF and also on PET. And this can in the future be extended. Uh, there's an ATN-based model which supports different uh, software types and uh, CSF assays and it provides this probability of dementia within a three and a five year time frame. And there's also this communication sheet, which actually has this double framing, the neutral framing, the graphical representation, the clear language. And we now have a feasibility pilot study ongoing in the Netherlands to see how doctors would 
would use or would not use and how they uh, value uh, the use of such a tool. And the next step would be to do a European prospective validation study. And with that, I come uh, at the end of this talk uh, where we talked about the assessment of risk and realized when you make a pre-dementia diagnosis of Alzheimer, you will actually always also have to talk about the risk of dementia. And in the context of MCI or in the stage of MCI, biomarkers can really help to make a more precise risk estimate of dementia. And then we talked about communication of risk. And that's a difficult concept because of the inherent uncertainty involved in risk and probability. And we know that the doctor really prefers to foster hope. It would be so nice to have a positive message. But in fact, patients, particularly when they come in the MCI stage, a lot of things are going wrong already at home. So in some cases, they're more helped by accurate information, the real story, uh, an explanation why things go wrong rather than hope, so they can plan ahead. E-tools to support the diagnostic process and to support communication of risk may be effective, and I showed you adept.health, you can look it up. It's not only in Dutch, but also in English and in Swedish and in German. Um, and using risk best practice, that means using these numbers, visual representation, acknowledging emotions, and the use of the teach back method can really help to convey your message, make it very clear, so people understand and recall, uh, and have a better uh, appreciation of both the doctor and the consultation. And I think these, this information already has great relevance today, because an accurate diagnosis helps to arrange, is actually the, the, tar the, um, the gateway to arranging proper care, and particularly tomorrow, when we will hopefully be able to prevent dementia, at least in some cases, by tailored combinations of both lifestyle and disease-modifying treatment. Thank you. Thank you, Luisje, for a very clear presentation. And I have one question uh, from a viewer online, and that also relates to my experience in clinical practice, that on the one hand, indeed, people want to know about their prognosis and risk, but on the other hand, they, offer, they often also suffer from emotional impacts of um, the potential future decline in daily life. So we try also to support them to focus more on, on the now than on the future. So can you uh, comment on the, the potential emotional impact on learning uh, about your prognosis? Yeah. So um, what, we, what we have shown in a number of studies is that actually anxiety does not increase uh, that much. Well, uncertainty actually decreases by uh, conveying the results of an amyloid PET scan, for example. So emotional impact is rather limited. Is we it also in, in the group of MCI patients? Because I saw in your study it were healthy volunteers. That so that study studies? is healthy volunteers, mm -hmm. but we also I was also now referring to a former study where we studied amyloid PET in clinical practice, which is really memory clinic uh, um, unselected memory clinic population. So there's also MCI in there. Um, and in terms of your question, I do understand that. And of course, I don't have the answer because this is very complicated. But I am reminded of a, um, uh, a story that, uh, that a, a son of a patient uh, told me, uh, where they were actually so much relieved by the diagnosis, and actually having the diagnosis in an early stage enabled them to focus on the now. So, Whilst I appreciate you really want to focus on the now and what's still possible now and maybe less focus on the prognosis, um, there, seems to, there seems to have, in my view, I think you, you would want to have a balance by actually having a more realistic um, uh, knowledge of what's going to come. It enables you to also more deliberately enjoy the now in as, in as much as is possible. Um, and that's very challenging. And also, I realize for every patient and every family different. Okay, so because of time, we need to end this, uh, this session. And I uh, to Before we end this session, we, I want to uh, recommend to you to go to the lunch session on Wednesday. It's organized by uh, 
the Dutch Alzheimer's Society. It will be on warm technology. It is in your program, but not in terms of title and, uh, and speakers, but it will be very interesting, so I really recommend it. And I definitely want to uh, congratulate all the speakers today with uh, their fantastic contributions. And uh, thank you all for being here, and I hope you have a nice rest of the conference. Thank mm -hmm. you.